Hi, this is Starkey Sowers, Director of Education for Clark's Nutrition and Natural Foods Market. Welcome again to another PLUS program training series. Today's topic, exploring teas. Well, you can't think about teas without imagining the thousands of gallons that are consumed literally hourly around the world when it comes to teas. In fact, tea is considered the number two beverage of choice around the world next to water. All right, so let's do a little history research. When we look at the board here, we actually see that Shanung, which was an emperor, actually gets credited for the consumption of green tea originally about 2700 BC. So if you want to add all that up, you're looking at over 4,000 years of tea consumption. And the Chinese actually get credited for this. So kind of looking at this a little bit different, one of the neat things about this story was this. He was actually boiling water outside and some green tea leaves actually fell into the pot. So instead of actually maybe clearing those leaves out and throwing them away, he embraced the idea of making the tea and drinking it. And for years, it, uh, green tea was actually considered a medicinal beverage because of this, because he actually labeled it as a medicine, so to speak. So we see a couple different dynasties. We see the Tang Dynasty and the Shang Dynasty that literally for thousands of years considered tea to be an actual medicine. And so there are medicinal properties about it. We'll actually explore that a little bit later. But it wasn't actually until later, what is, what is known as the Ming Dynasty, about 618 AD, that we actually see tea being consumed as a beverage of choice. So with that said, let's kind of look at some green teas and some teas, so to speak, to maybe see some of the differences, because there's a lot of differences when it comes to green teas. So once again, looking at the board, we see a couple different things. First of all, tea consumption and tea manufacturing is av absolutely evident throughout the whole world. About 25 to 30% being from China, about 25% or better being from India. And so that was an interesting story as well too. And we'll have to look at that in section number two. But with that said, what we notice is this, is there's different types of teas being from the same exact type of plant or the exact same plant, so to speak, called the Camellia sinensis. And so when it grows in different areas and different topography and different types of weather, different types of soil conditions and things of this nature, when it comes also to processing, we have different types of teas. In fact, there's over 150 plus different varieties of teas that are on the market. All right, so a lot of different specifics, even though it's the same plant, Obviously, almost like fine wine, so to speak, that grow in different regions of France and things of that nature. All right, so let's explore a couple more uh, teas that are a little bit kind of branched out here. So when we look at it, being the same plant, the Camellia sinensis, we see that that particular leaf, so to speak, picked usually on the first or the second day of the year. And what they do is actually pick it really just about the time that it's you know, starting to bud or open up as a leaf. And then actually it's dried and then processed to a point of like refinement, such as like making a, like either just like a, a leaf, so to speak, and then put into a container and it's actually called white tea. And so white tea is actually really highly effective in being a polyphenol compound or antioxidants. It's considered to be out of all the teas, the most abundant in polyphenols, which are the antioxidants that are so beneficial in green teas and white teas. All right. So at one point, this was actually a tea considered only for royalty. And so it was very scarce for a large particular amount of years. All right. So next on the list is green tea. So when we look at green tea, what's nice about green tea is a little bit more comfortable. Um, we've had it around for quite some time. And green tea, when you look at it, as we were saying, when it comes to tea consumption, would be the number two consumed beverage in the world. And so a couple different things, they can either fire roast it or they can take it and actually dry it and then actually just kind of let it sift out. And then what they do from there is basically just make it a tea of consumption. Oftentimes we see it in a couple of different areas. We might see it um, like in a tea bag or just loose. So ultimately that's what we call green tea. And green tea, of course, is the one that's becoming so popular here in the United States. All right. So next on the list is oolong tea. Once again, from the same plant, this particular picking, so to speak, of these leaves usually happens in the summer months. And as you know, the oxidation or the changes of the leaf color uh, being uh, more prevalent towards the summer and the fall months, we see the, the changes occur. And so when it comes to oolong tea, one of the things that they do is they actually partially ferment it. So that partial fermentation process, so to speak, actually increases the amount of caffeine content and reduces the polyphenols. The thing that oolong tea becomes so popular for is actually for weight loss beverage and like a summer tea beverage. And so finally, the next one on the list is what we call black tea. And black tea, of course, is uh, the most common in the United States. About 90% of teas consumed in the United States is typically black tea, although green tea seems to be kind of creeping up slowly but surely. 
So when we look at black tea, it's fully fermented for a longer period of time. And we see a greater increase in caffeine content that actually takes place. And so same exact tea leaf picked early when, you know, in the winter months, giving us the white tea and then the green tea being picked in the springtime. And then we see the oolong being picked in the summer. And then finally, the black in the summer to uh, early fall. And as the leaf changes, so does the caffeine content. We'll have a look at that in the next uh, session as well. But ultimately, when we look at the benefits, the benefits of tea literally has boiled down to the idea of green teas. And so when we look at the benefits of green teas and some of the medicinal qualities, so to speak, of green teas, this is what's really kind of made tea consumption so popular. So the polyphenols, as I was stating before, which are the antioxidant compounds, have all sorts of different types of benefits. Number one, it seems to have a protective benefit for certain types of cardiovascular disease, as well as certain types of cancers. Mind you, these are epidemiological studies, which means that individuals that consume more of these teas as one's lifetime, so to speak, would have less incidence of heart disease, as well as certain types of cancer. Additionally, also good for intestinal health, antibacterial. And finally, it also has what we call the amino acid theanine, which is not only good for the immune system, but it's also good to kind of calm the body and relax the mind, making tea consumption one of the favorite things for so many people to do. This is Starkey Sowers, Director of Education, thanking you for watching another PLUS program training series.